This is it. We've reached the end of our big sedan challenge. It's such relief over here. It's <laughs> such an accomplishment and a relief all at the same time. It's great. We had this crazy idea. Honestly, years ago, we began talking about these two ridiculous cars on our podcast. How over much? a decade ago, actually. Well, so I've been talking about the Phaeton for more than a decade. You're yeah. right. And we realized, because I've talked smack about Quattroportes and Maserati in general for so long, we thought, well, naturally, I have to get a QP5. You're watching Everyday Driver. We make a TV show, podcast, and YouTube channels dedicated to great cars, driving adventures, and helping you find a car you'll love. Subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss a thing. The initial idea, let's just put it out there, was to go buy old sedans for roughly five or six thousand dollars. My Phaeton was forty-nine ninety-five, and because it was the Maserati, we made an exception for Paul because his car was not that cheap. If you find a five thousand dollar Maserati Quattroporte, run away. Don't buy that car. We almost didn't buy this, but the accomplishment for this car was not only buying it for under $11,000 in Las Vegas with a credit card. That's an accomplishment. <laughs> it sounds like the start of a mob film. I went to Vegas and here's what I did. So we did do that. Now, some of you have said over the year, you've said, you know, why didn't you get a Phaeton like this? Why didn't you get a Maserati like this? Because they aren't as cheap as we bought these for. Why did you get a Lexus LS400 and just be done with it? We could have done that as well. But the big challenge here was to buy something that was not the worst one you've ever seen and just put it in the shop and talk about how awful it is. We didn't want to do that. We also didn't buy one that was already definitely broken down and just going to be absurd or lifted or something stupid. We plan to drive these. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of yeah. is that over the year we've done a lot of different events, adventures, and we've put miles on these. I put 6,500 miles on my Phaeton in a year. I have really driven this year round, snow, ice, road trips, the salt flats. We've done it all. Starting off with the autocross, we had to race them a little bit. But I will concede, you won the, the whole autocross thing. <laughs> I did win uh, the autocross. Autocross, but I, I'm going to complain because the whole course was just full of rocks and dirt. I was just sliding around. I was understeering everywhere. If we had a proper track, I think this could really give you a run here. Possibly. The other reason that the Phaeton did so well in autocross is we'd driven our actual sports cars prior and been very ginger because the course was really slick with that after snow gravel. Yes, but the yeah. Phaeton not only beat the Maserati, but had the second fastest time of the day because I offered it zero mechanical sympathy. It has all wheel drive. It has a traditional automatic. Two things your car did not. Right. So when it was go time, I just buried the throttle and hoped for the best and just hung on to the boat. And I came away with a surprisingly good autocross time. One of the many lessons of the year is if you want to do autocross, get a Phaeton, clearly. I mean, that's the answer. We also had to take these cars on a road trip. And yes. not just across the state. We had to change states. We had to do at least a thousand miles, which we did successfully. Yes. And even though I fell in love even more with my QP5 on the road trip, because I thought, all right, let's, let's talk about the basics. Am I safe? Yeah. Am I going fast? Yeah. The car's running, right? Uh -huh. And I have air conditioning. The end. <laughs> I, could just, I just need gas and we'll keep going. And indeed, both cars shocked us both. They did great. We finished the road trip successfully. Nothing major happened. Some things happened along the way, but nothing major, and we got back home. Yes. I loved driving this on the road. It was great. I know you did. Now, the Maserati does rotate much better than the Phaeton. It is a surprising car dynamically, but I have to say, if you're going to do a road trip and saw cross country, you just want comfort, and I think, I think here, the Phaeton won again. I mean, on just sheer road tripping, I mean, 75% of it. Okay, I'll take 75% I mean, because a with a weird name. It is. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And it worked great on the road trip. Here's a question, though. What was the biggest surprise for you about these cars? Oh, the biggest surprise was, first of all, my now love for Maserati brand. <laughs> yes. I don't love all their models. Yes, okay. Wrong, but I've really come around. Instead of just teasing them, I've now spent time with them enough to know that Indeed, I do like that, and to Todd's point, it does rotate well. It's a driver's car, mm -hmm. despite the length of it, the size, and all that kind of stuff. It's a true driver's car. It's got a longer wheelbase than the Phaeton, and it handles better. It does. I love this. But the second thing was that I actually really loved the handling. I didn't think I'd like the car sure, itself. Sure. So the brand and the car just surprised me. Honestly. All of us that have paid attention to your um, vitriol toward Maserati have been surprised by your love of it. Yeah. But honestly, the biggest surprise for me with the Phaeton 
is the fact that I liked it as much as I did. Because I'm the guy, look, I cherish my Lotus Elise. I like light, I like direct handling. I don't mind if it's raw. That's the kind of car that I want. And now I have inexplicably experienced the pinnacle of the other end of the experience. I am now spoiled to heated and cooled seats. I only want heated seats now going forward on every Utah winter. The all-wheel drive, the great planted nature, the fact that you could saw across the country and be almost as comfortable as you would be sitting at home watching a movie. And I now understand that. And to the point, to the point, and my wife and my co-host both think I'm insane, if I could find a great one of these for 15 or 20 grand, I'd be very tempted to own it because it was that phenomenal. Now, this one, this one wasn't that good. This one at $5,000 has uh, old car gremlins. And now you add, because here's the thing, any $5,000 car has got gremlins. But you add those $5,000 car gremlins on top of a car that originally cost near 100 grand and is a tech powerhouse from 15 years ago, that's a scary reality. This all leads us to the scariest things about these cars. So the scariest thing on the Maserati is the startup. It's my understanding it's the valve actuator system. It's sort of like Honda's VTEC, but these actuators are installed in such a way that it creates more wear than the way they're supposed to be installed. <laughs> and so that's actually turns into a really expensive, what I understand, $8,000 repair job. That all pales in comparison with the Duo Select transmission, which was an early, a precursor, a test bed for the transmission that went into later Ferraris. So it wasn't quite developed and it makes BMW's SMG look like a brilliant transmission. The transmission lasted, but it's gonna need service and somebody's gonna have to pay for it. I will say the scariest thing on the Phaeton is definitely the fact that it is so intertwined with an ancient technological head unit that controls everything in the car. You can't replace it, you can't take it out. And as it starts to get gremlins and go bad, it can take down everything. There's two batteries, there's two wiper motors. There's so much redundancy that now means twice as much stuff can break. This has run really well, 6,500 miles this year in every condition you can imagine. I've been genuinely surprised by how well it's run. However, every month it kind of taps on my shoulder and goes, excuse me, I need this now. Now it hasn't been anything catastrophic except for the front struts, which were thousands of dollars when I first bought the car, but all the O4s have that problem. So let's just embrace that. Now we have to talk about speed. As fast as these cars can go, we took the cars to Bonneville Salt Flats. And by taking the cars there, I mean, we didn't do anything. We drove them from our houses, <laughs> two and a half hours, arrived, promptly didn't check tire pressures or fluids or anything else. We just put our helmets on and thought, see what she'll do. <laughs> and we did. And it turns out the Maserati is fast and it's stable and it's better than you think on this granola, crusty, shredded wheat sort of salt substance. It turned out to be awesome. I was so impressed and amazed. Top speed of 165 with a tailwind. And that was all she had. I have to give you top speed at Salt Flats. I was hoping that I could hit 155. The limiter on the Phaeton in the US is 135 and it is a hard limiter. It came down and just said, no more for you. Your car 165 miles an hour is simultaneously amazing and horrifying that we're out there doing that. I really think Bonneville Speed Week should have a separate class for I drove it from my house. Yes. yes. I didn't bring it in on a trailer. I haven't looked at it with a bunch of my crew. I just drove it here this morning, put it on the salt flats, went top speed. That's what we did. Don't check tire pressures. Don't do anything. That was one of the more insane ideas we had for these cars, but we just figured let's do stuff that honestly you would think about but wouldn't want to do because of the terror of it breaking. And then we're still getting salt out of these cars. So now that brings us to how much did we spend on these cars in nearly a year of ownership. After buying them, I am proud to say the Maserati turned out to be a reliable Maserati. <laughs> I spent less money maintaining it than Todd did. That's true. The ratio of buy a car for, you know, pay more money buying it than you spend on maintenance remains intact. Everything is fine. I did smell a burning smell on the way over here and the electrics are now really kind of screwed because you turn on the right turn signal while the headlights are on and the interior lights flash and there's no brake lights. I haven't fixed that yet. And the fuel needle is in question. Sometimes I think it's working. Sometimes I think it's just kind of teasing me a little bit. But other than that, I'm safe. The car's fast. It works and the air conditioner works. And I'm proud of my reliable Maserati. 
You didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. At the same time though, let's, let's go ahead and be honest about the fact that one of the reasons that Paul spent less on maintenance than I did, and he did, is because he ignored more things. And the things you've ignored are, are financially catastrophic. You're familiar with the phrase, passing the buck? This is pretty much the manifestation of that. And you spent what, all told? Just under $16,000. The maintenance itself was not that much. Tires, a battery, oil change that I did myself and yeah, I yeah. highly don't recommend. <laughs> Clearly designed to take to the dealer. It actually reminded you every time anything went wrong, it reminded you, go to dealer, just go to dealer. <laughs> it's Friday, go to dealer. The car's running fine, go to dealer. All told, I spent about $12,500 between purchase price and maintenance. The things pending on my car aren't that bad. I need a head gasket, I have a small oil leak. You're playing put a finger in the dam with the weird leaks that are happening from the coolant system, which apparently is just a Volkswagen thing from the era. There is a check engine light that is actually just wrong. The switches on the driver's door don't actually open a couple of the things. Apparently it's a few hundred dollar fix. I'm not gonna worry about that either because I am, again, we're giving these cars away, but by and large, my car runs it's legal, it has all its lights. I could go take it cross country right now, which is actually probably more than I could say for you. However, I did spend it's about $7,000 worth of maintenance in one calendar year. I did it, I did it. So you don't have to. Since we're gluttons for punishment, we don't love it, but we understand what it's like to live with these cars and we want to keep our anxiety going. So that means we are embarking on a brand new challenge which is an inexpensive sports car challenge. Keep in mind that when we embarked on this big sedan challenge, we just kind of laughed about it and tried it. We didn't know what we were gonna do with them. We kept having an adventure and going, you know what we should do next? That's not the approach on these cheap sports cars. We're gonna shop for rear wheel drive, manual transmission, shop like you would. Again, it's not gonna be the most broken down one we can find. It's gonna be one that is actually a decent example for less than $7,500 yeah. that we can actually put as least as many miles on as we did with these. We're gonna drive them year round here in Utah, do all kinds of crazy things with them. We're very excited about it. We've been talking about it for months on the podcast. So we're gonna give these away to some lucky one of you, and then we're gonna move on to even more. <laughs>